Welcome back. Now we are going to talk about solutions. We're going to talk about dissolving things in other things, which means that we're going to be learning a little bit about how things dissolve, and we're also going to be talking about what uh, the units of concentration are. When you dissolve one thing into another, you have A going into B. So the particles of A have to separate, then the particles of B have to separate, and then they mingle. So you have uh, lots of little bits and pieces of A over here, and over here you have B. They have to separate so that there is room in between the different particles. You can't get A into the spaces in between B if there aren't any spaces in between B. So they have to separate. That is an energy in process. Okay? You have to put energy in to pull things apart. Okay? So if you start here, energy zero, then you have to put you have to put energy in to separate A. You have to put more energy in to separate B. Then you mix the two together and they mingle and hopefully they are nice and happy when they are mingling. And depending on how happy they are, you're going to get energy back out when you mix them together. So the question is, is that enough to make the mixture lower in energy, more stable, than the original two things separate was. So if the it only comes down to here, then you're not going to get a mix. If it comes down to here, then you would get a mix. Uh, it's not really easy to predict that beforehand. Um, mostly what you would do is you'd throw this stuff in solution and see if it mixes. You can also come up with a decent idea uh, by comparing different things. You can also affect things by changing the temperature of the water, things like that. So it's not uh, a constant. But generally, we can separate things into you know, soluble and insoluble, and we can talk about how soluble things are. And a good rule of thumb is that like dissolves like. Okay. So a polar material will dissolve a polar material. A nonpolar material will dissolve a nonpolar material. Uh, salts or ionic compounds will generally dissolve in polar materials. Okay. So salt will dissolve in water, uh, oil will dissolve in hexane, but water and oil just don't mix. Now, some things are perfectly soluble, perfectly miscible. Solubility or miscibility are just synonyms. Okay. So water and ethanol are an example of two things that are perfectly soluble in one another. You keep adding ethanol to water, you will never get a separation. You'll never have a layer of mixed water and ethanol and a layer of water or a layer of ethanol. No. Basically, it'll just be, you know, you're pouring ethanol into water until it gets to the point where you're pouring ethanol into a slightly watered down solution of ethanol. Okay? It's always going to be soluble. But that is not always the case. It's usually not the case. And solubility can be measured in a lot of different ways, but usually it's measured in grams per liter. For example, you could dissolve, say, 5 grams of uh, NaNO3, just making up a number, in 875 uh, milliliters of water at 25 degrees Celsius. I'm just making these numbers up at random. Don't assume that that's you know, at all true for this particular salt. Don't assume that it's at all true for any salts. But you know, you do the conversions that you'd have to do, and what that would get you would be 5.71 grams per liter for the solubility of NaNO3. So that is one way. It's definitely not the only way of measuring uh, solubility. Just uh, try and uh, keep those sorts of things in mind. That solubility is something you have to measure. It's not automatic. It's not universal. And it's not infinite.
But we generally speak of soluble versus insoluble compounds. A soluble thing is where you can throw it into solution and you have to add a significant amount before it becomes saturated. So for example, NaCl is soluble in water. Okay. That doesn't mean that it's infinitely soluble. It's not perfectly miscible. It's not like ethanol. But uh, you have to throw in a significant amount of sodium chloride before it becomes saturated. Now, saturated just means that you know you see solid lying on the bottom. You have max amount in solution. So that is saturation. So a. Uh, this is uh, my abbreviation for solution. All right. So solution means that you or saturation means that you cannot get any more of your solute into uh, solution. So more vocabulary. Uh, solvent is doing the dissolving. Okay, so that is usually you know a liquid you are dissolving something in, and the solute is the thing being dissolved. So solute, solvent, and if you throw enough solute into your solvent, eventually you'll reach saturation. And the solute and the solvent together are the solution. Okay. The other alternative is something that is insoluble. Uh, only a very, very small amount can dissolve. It's usually not the case that something is perfectly insoluble, especially uh, ionic compounds. Usually at least a very small amount will go into solution. And we will be talking about that sort of thing later and doing math with it. Yay! Precipitation reactions. I mentioned in a previous video about uh, double displacement reactions. And that is a category of reaction where you have a solution of a salt with a solution of a different salt. Okay, so you're making two different solutions together and seeing what happens. Here we have uh, a solution of salt AB mixing with a solution of salt CD. Okay, so all they're doing in a double displacement reaction is they're swapping partners. So uh, you have AD and CB. Uh, we have four uh, possibilities. Either AD and CB are both soluble, they both remain in solution, that is no reaction. Because, basically, here's what's happening. AB aqueous plus CD aqueous is going to form AD aqueous plus CB aqueous. But when a salt, an ionic compound, is dissolved in solution, what that really means is that the ions have separated. So you have A plus and B minus, C plus, D minus, and over here, A plus and D minus are floating around in solution, C plus and B minus also floating around in solution. So here's A plus floating free, B plus B minus, sorry, floating free, and here we have C plus and D minus. This is not a commentary on your grades, Richard. But uh, in order for a reaction to occur, something has to change. Okay, so if you have all these ions floating around free and as reactants, and they're still floating around free as products, that means nothing has changed. No reaction has occurred. Now. The, uh, the, the far extreme from that is that both AD and CB are insoluble, meaning that they precipitate out of the, out of the solution. Sorry, they fall out of solution or come out of solution. Okay, they become solid and fall to the bottom of solution. And that's a complicated mess because both of them are present everywhere in the solution. So instead of getting a nice tidy pile of AB or AD over here and CB over on the other side. Instead, you get this nasty mess where they're both all mixed up on the bottom of the beaker. And there is my nasty mess of a picture. And it's full of some sort of solution. Okay. 
It is actually very, very difficult to come up with a situation like that. Not impossible, just difficult. Uh, I won't try coming up with one off the cuff. Now, usually what we're looking for is that one of the two will be soluble and the other one will be insoluble. And that is far more typical of a precipitation reaction. So one example for that, a very, very real example, okay, sodium chloride is a, or sorry, is soluble in solution. And then you have silver nitrate, which is also soluble. This is a three. When you mix them together, they swap partners and you end up with sodium nitrate, still nicely soluble, and silver chloride. Silver chloride's insoluble. It falls out of solution as a bright white solid. This is the sort of thing that shows up pretty frequently in chemistry labs. I can't recall if we will be doing one. But you have to be careful of silver chloride. Uh, it will stain your skin. You may or may not notice it right away. It'll leave a bright white blotch on your skin. If you're very, very pale, it just won't show up. But silver chloride responds, it reacts to ultraviolet light. And the silver instead reacts and you get... Uh, silver oxide, which is a, a dark black or purple color, meaning that uh, your skin will end up with a big purple blotch on it. But not right away. It'll, it'll, it will take until the next time you step out into sunlight, basically. So that's one thing to watch out for. Also, silver chloride is slightly toxic. Uh, so, you know, be careful of that as well. But silver chloride, because it responds to light in this way, used to be used as one of the earliest uh, uh, photochemicals, you know, for, for taking photographs. You, know, you expose something to, you expose a film coated with silver chloride to, to light and it, it develops a picture. Okay. It wasn't great, but it was one of the early steps. I like, I like knowing interesting things. And if you don't think it's interesting, then you suck and I hate you. So these are some of the rules for how you can tell if something is soluble or insoluble. These are the things that are always or almost always soluble. First off, ammonium is always soluble. Doesn't matter what it's partnered with. Uh, next up, we have the alkali metals. Okay, so you'll recall the alkali metals are the first column. Any salt containing one of these guys is always going to be soluble. It doesn't matter what it's partnered with, it will dissolve very nicely in water. As for anions, these three you pretty much just have to memorize. Okay. Uh, nitrate, acetate, and chlorate. Okay. So nitrate, NO3 minus CO3, or ClO3 minus, um, those you pretty much just have to remember. Uh, acetate, C2H3O2, one minus. Just think vinegar, okay? Because uh, uh, HC2H3O2, Vinegar is acetic acid. Okay, so if you think vinegar, um, think salad, vinegar and oil don't mix. Vinegar is soluble in water because it's not soluble in oil. Maybe that'll help. I don't know. You may not like salads. I know I don't. All right, but uh, acetate is just one of those things that's always soluble. All right. Now, the halides, uh, specifically uh, chloride, bromide, and iodide, are almost always soluble. There are three exceptions to that. Uh, silver, mercury 1, or lead 2. Okay. Silver, mercury 1, you might recall, you should recall, is Hg2, 2 plus, And then we have lead 2 plus. You pair any one of those three with any one of these three, and you're going to get an insoluble compound. We probably won't be playing with mercury just because it's a little bit more toxic than we usually like. Uh, lead is also toxic, but not as toxic, so you might get to play around with that. And silver is expensive, so you won't necessarily get to play around with that, but you might. You might. When I say play, I mean in lab, so not so much with the playing. Not so much fun. 
But again, those are just things you're going to have to remember, things you're going to have to memorize. Let's see. Mercury, silver, and lead. It's a map. Or maybe if you're fans of The Office, Pam. I don't know. Find a way. Find a way. I believe in you. I believe in all of you. And it's been about 15 minutes, so I'm going to go ahead and call it there. Uh, when we come back in our next lecture, we will continue talking about solubility rules with sulfates. Then we'll go into the insoluble things, and we will move on from there.